All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off, um, and we're still going to be talking about Lewis structures, but we're going to be expanding on them a little bit. All right, next I want to talk to you guys about something called constitutional isomers. Let's see if I can fit all that on the screen. Constitutional isomers. Okay. Basically, what constitutional isomers are, um, they are possible whenever you have a molecular formula that might have more than one valid Lewis structure. Yeah, sometimes you can have a formula that's got more than one Lewis structure that's you know perfectly okay, perfectly valid. And so those are referred to as constitutional isomers of each other. They have the same molecular formula. And a different placement of atoms and bonds. Okay, so again, this refers to two valid Lewis structures, so it's not just a willy nilly arrangement, they both have to follow the rules, or they all have to follow the rules. Alright, let me show you. Some examples of what I mean. All right. So let's say you had the formula C2H6O. All right. Um, you would find that when you did this, you would be able to make more than one valid Lewis structure. Um, by this, by the way, uh, at this point, I'm not going to go through the whole process of listing all the valence electrons and catting them up and all that. I think you guys are, should be pretty good at that by now. If you have some questions about it, let me know. All right. So I'm going to show you how I can draw a couple of valid Lewis structures for C2H6O. All right. So let's see. Let's just start this way. Let's see. I got two carbons. What would happen if I took two carbons, linked them together? and maybe included in oxygen as well, all right? If I took this and then filled out the rest of the bonds with hydrogens, right? So this one needs three more bonds, so we're going to put three hydrogens there. This carbon would like to have two more bonds, so we can put two hydrogens. And this oxygen would like to have one more bond, all right? And it's going to have a couple of unshared pairs of electrons. All right. If you were to go through here and add up all the valence electrons from C2H6O, you would see that they would to that, excuse me that that would total I believe 20. And if you look at the number of electrons in the structure, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So yes, this is a perfectly valid Lewis structure. However, it's not the only one that we can draw. Instead of going CCO, maybe we went C. O, C, okay? And again, we could go through and fill in all the missing pieces here with H's. So the C needs three more bonds, so we give it three H's. This C needs three more bonds, so we give it three H's. Oxygen's already got two bonds, so it's good as it is, and you can just um, include the unshared pairs, all right? This also... Um, correctly maps out the number of Lewis, uh, number of valence electrons that you have. Um, all atoms follow the octet rules. It's a perfectly valid Lewis structure. So we would say that these two guys are Lewis structure, or excuse me, are constitutional isomers of each other. They are different molecules. All right. So for C2H6O, you can draw two different Lewis structures, two different constitutional isomers. Let me highlight a mistake a lot of people make. All right, I'm going to erase this one so I have some room. All right, I have, every year, a lot of people who will give me an answer like this. And they'll want to say, okay, this is another separate constitutional isomer. This is not. This is not a separate constitutional isomer. This is a duplicate of the first one that we drew, all right? It's nothing different, it's not chemically different. Imagine this, imagine this molecule was just sort of hanging in midair, 
I know it's kind of a hard thing to imagine. Let's just say you had like this drawing, you know, sitting in midair, and you're looking at it from the front. All right, what if the molecule stayed still and you walked around the back and looked at it from another angle? All right, if you did, then it would look like the bottom one. Right, so you're not changing the nature of the molecule at all. You're just changing the angle at which you're viewing it. So something like this is not a separate Lewis structure, separate constitutional isomer. This is uh, isomer. This is a duplicate. If you put a duplicate on a quiz or an exam or something, you know I won't count it off. I mean it's not a wrong answer. It's just it's almost like you're putting the same answer twice. But I will look for each and every correct, different constitutional isomer. All right. Let's try another one. Let's try. C2, H4, Cl2. All right. All right, so, you know, we can start it off pretty easy. We could have two carbons linked together. Like that, each of them with two H's. And we could put a Cl on both of them. All right. Each Cl is going to have three unshared pairs of electrons. And if you go through and calculate the number of valence electrons, I think you would find that it would match up very, very well with the structure. Okay? All octet rules are followed, so this is a good Lewis structure. All right? I can tell you there's one more constitutional isomer. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. All right? How about this one? What do you guys think? Give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Three, two, one. No, this is not. This is another duplicate. It doesn't matter which direction, up, down, to the side, whatever, you're pointing the bond. It means the same thing. Remember, true, ad true molecules are actually in a three-dimensional arrangement. This is just a... Uh, junk calls. Um, this is just sort of a model that we're using in two dimensions. All right? So just changing which direction the uh, bonds are pointed doesn't change anything about the nature of the molecule. We will see how we can tweak that a little bit in a future chapter, chapter 5, but for right now, that's not going to mean anything. All right. How about this? Well, earlier, earlier we saw that putting the oxygen in the middle was helpful. So, let's see. Can we do that? And maybe we could have a CL hanging off of one of the other ones. All right. What about that one? Hopefully, you have recognized that this is total nonsense. And this is not going to work because this guy right over here, is going to have two bonds, and that's a big, big no-no for halogens. Halogens just don't make more than one bond, except for very extreme situations. All right? So you would be able to recognize by looking at your charts that this is not going to be a, an answer that makes sense. All right, how about this one? Instead of having the two CLs on separate, carbons, what if we put them on the same carbon? So we just put one H on the left carbon and we put three of them over here. And we can see that yes, this does indeed work. So this is a good Lewis structure. So, And you can see this one is definitely different from the previous one we drew. So these are in fact two different constitutional isomers. Next one's a little tricky. Let's see. Let's take a look at it. This would be awesome to do in person because then, you know, I could watch you try to figure it out. 
and you know, use that whole nonverbal cue thing, but can't do that right now, so I'll do the best I can. But this one's interesting. All right, so let's say we have C3H6. All right, so a natural place to start is to just, you know, put them all in a row. All right, if you look at the number of valence electrons we have here, we're going to have 18 total. Um, 12 total from the three carbons and then six from the six hydrogens. All right, so we also need to start distributing the hydrogens around. You know, we could try this. Right, and that takes care of all of our um, carbons and our hydrogens, but hopefully you should see a problem here, right? We have a neutral C3H6 molecule, but we have incomplete octets here and here, so that would mean each one of these carbons would have a formal charge, a plus one, and so that would be a total charge of plus two. That doesn't match up, right? So what did we do whenever we found that we were, you know, missing electrons? You'll notice that we only have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons here when we were supposed to place 18. What do we do when we have a situation like this where we're missing electrons? That's where you're going to start looking into adding a double bond, all right? So we could put a double bond, for instance, maybe between those two carbons. However, that is going to require us that we rearrange our H's a little bit. So, what if instead of having three H, two H's on the end carbon, we'll put three, all right? Instead of having two H's on the middle, we're only going to have one, and then we're going to make a double bond with this end carbon. All right, voila! Everything follows the octet rule. We have the correct number of electrons. Our charges work out. This is a valid Lewis structure. So this is going to be one of our two constitutional isomers for this formula. The second one is very tricky. I encourage you right now to pause the video and see, and take some scratch paper, see what you can come up with. I'll give you a few seconds pause uh, as a buffer before I actually draw the next one on. Three, two... One. All right, here's the second one. Whoops. You can actually take those three carbons and draw them in a cyclic structure. Yes, we can have rings. Everything we've been doing so far is what we call acyclic. This is a cyclic structure, and if you fill in The rest of the H's, each carbon has four bonds, each H has one bond. We have C3H6, this works. So that one was tricky, that one was tricky. So if you didn't get that one, don't be too discouraged, I'd just like to see whoever can get that one. But we do have to take into account cyclic species whenever we draw um, Lewis structures. So these two guys would again be constitutional isomers of each other. All right. So that's one way that that's one sort of application in which we can use Lewis structures to, to explore a little bit further. Now I want to explore something again you've probably heard of this before but we're going to revisit it and that's called resonance. All right. At this point, I would ask if anybody remembers, you know, what resonance means. Usually I'll get people staring at me with blank expressions or the deer in the headlights look. So, unfortunately, I don't get the satisfaction of that, so I'm just going to tell you. All right, whenever you're drawing resonance, that is specifically showing the movement of very specific types of electrons. Okay? So, whenever you have resonance structures, you're going to have the same arrangement of atoms, right? The atoms themselves are not going to move. But they're going to have a different arrangement of electrons. 
And it's not just any electrons. It's going to be specific types of electrons. Um, at this point, it's a good idea to sort of revisit the definitions of sigma and pi electrons. Right? Hopefully you guys remember the definition. If not, I'll go over it with you real quick. So let's say you have, you know, I don't know, a carbon-carbon single bond. Right? Any single bond is referred to as a sigma bond. And the electrons that are in a sigma bond are sigma electrons. Okay? Now, we learned, of course, you can have double and triple bonds. All right? If you have a double bond, one of the bonds, one of the electron pairs in the bond is always going to be sigma. And the other one is always going to be pi. Okay? And then you can have triple bonds. If you have a triple bond, one of the electron pairs is sigma, and the other two are pi. Okay. So be sure to refresh yourself on what pi electrons and sigma electrons are. We have three different types of electrons overall we can kind of, you know, think about moving. Sigma, pi, and unshared pairs. Something very important to remember. You can only... Move pi electrons and unshared electron pairs. You cannot move sigmas. So, not only are they going to have the same arrangement of atoms, they're going to have the same arrangement of sigma bonds as well. But we can move around pi electrons and unshared pairs. Right? The whole purpose of showing resonance structures is to show that, you know, Electrons can move around, right? Drawing resonance structure shows something called delocalization of electrons. And that's important, especially we're going to see that in Chapter 2, because the more delocalized you have electrons within a molecule, the more stable the molecule is, right? Think about it this way. Let's say you're sharing. Um, let's say you're sharing a dorm room with with your roommate, right? Um, you have a couple of options. You and your roommate could be smushed together in the corner, right? All crowded, big elbows bumping into each other and everything. Or you could be spread out in the room, with each of you having enough room to go about your business. Which situation would you rather be in? Probably the latter one, right? That would probably be a more stable situation. The more electrons can spread out, the happier they are. And that makes for a more stable molecule or ion. All right? So let me show you this in action. Let's say we have this structure. Now, hopefully, by now looking at this, you can recognize, hey, that end's got two electron pairs. It usually doesn't have that. So it's got a higher electron density than usual, so that nitrogen has a negative charge. It's got a formal charge, negative one. All right? Now, the nitrogen could hold on to that negative charge, but that negative charge will be a lot more um, stable if it's spread out. So what can happen is we can actually show through something called an electron mechanism how these electrons can move around. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm going to use this pair of electrons as an example. This pair of electrons could, it could swoop over here right next door to make a double bond with this carbon. All right, notice I drew a double-headed arrow that sort of looked like a, looks like a fish, curved fish hook. In fact, they're called fish hook arrows, and that's how we illustrate electron movement.
All right. So let's say this pair of electrons just kind of swooped over and made a double bond with carbon. All right, that would make nitrogen, you know, neutral. However, that would be a big no-no for carbon. Why is that? Because carbon would then have 10 electrons, and we know that that's not a good thing for carbon. It can't expand in this octet. However, carbon could make room for a pair of these electrons if it kicked a pair of pi electrons up to this oxygen. Okay? And if it does that, then you would now have this. This oxygen would now have three unshared pairs of electrons and only one bond. Still follows the octet rule though, right? It's still only got eight. This carbon could now have a double bond with nitrogen. Carbon still has eight electrons. And now nitrogen only has one unshared pair. Nitrogen still has eight electrons as well. All right. Now you'll notice now, that now though that oxygen's got a higher electron density, so it's going to have a negative charge. That's something that's very, very important to remember. As you go from one resonance structure to another, charge in must equal charge out. Each resonance structure must have an overall charge equivalent to the other one. And we represent two different resonance structures by using this arrow. That's the resonance arrow. Okay? So if you draw this arrow between two structures, it means they're resonance structures of each other. All right. Hopefully you guys are getting the hang of this. The resonance for some people is a little bit more difficult than, than the regular Lewis structure comment or uh, uh, material, but with practice you should get the hang of it. Um, in fact, this is something that's kind of either cool or maddening, depending on your perspective. These aren't actually real. Neither one of these is a true, accurate representation of what's going on in the molecule. It's a model to sort of make it easy for you to see how the electrons are moving. The real truth is somewhere in between. So what we can also do is draw a hybrid structure that maybe more closely mirrors what's actually going on. Here's how you draw a hybrid. All right? First of all, draw everything that's constant. Draw everything that never changes. So you know you have sort of this backbone here. This oxygen's always going to have two unshared pairs of electrons. <coughs> My daughter just sneezed, bless you. All right. This nitrogen's always going to have these bonds and these unshared pairs of electrons. Right? These are the features that are constant in both of the structures. Now, sometimes you have a double bond between carbon and oxygen, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have one between carbon and nitrogen, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have an extra electron pair on either oxygen or nitrogen, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to draw partial bonds, and we do that by drawing little dotted lines. And it's kind of hard to do on, the st on here, so if it doesn't end up perfectly dotted, I'm going to try it again. Dot, 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 dot. There we go, that's better. All right, that represents partial bonds, and it tells you that electrons sort of travel in between those two areas. All right, you also have to represent something called partial charge, and this may not be it may be something you haven't seen before. Sometimes you have an excess of electron density that's enough to be substantial, but not change the full charge. That's when you can employ partial charges. All right, so let's take a look at this oxygen, for example. Sometimes it's neutral, like in the top structure, right? Sometimes it's got a full negative, like in the bottom structure, right? So what's the sort of the in-between? That is a partial negative, all right? And we represent partials with the lowercase delta sign, and then we put whatever charge is appropriate, right? So this oxygen is going to have a partial negative. Same with this nitrogen. This nitrogen is sometimes fully negative, sometimes it's neutral, so it's also going to have, and that's hard to draw this with a stylus, it's also going to have a partial negative. Okay, So you can see in this case we have two resonance structures and we've also drawn the hybrid. Hey, does anybody have any questions? Nope, sounds good. <laughs> no, in all seriousness. Write down any questions you have. Let me know what they are.
Bring them to, yeah, bring them to the in-person sessions. That's, that's what they're for, right? All right. Let's do another one. Let's say we had this. Okay. All right. In this case, we're starting off having a positively charged carbon, right? You can see it's got an incomplete octet, so it's got a positive charge, all right? So again, let's take a look at what we could move around. In this case, it's pretty easy to identify what we're going to move because, remember, we can only move pi electrons or unshared pairs. Well, all we got is just one little pair of pi electrons, so that has to be the pair of electrons that moves. When you move it over, like this, you can satisfy that positive charge. Important point of consideration here. You can't just move electrons willy-nilly. So you can't just take a pair of electrons from one end of, the, end of the molecule and like put them on the other end. They have to move adjacently, right? The most they can move over is sort of like a swinging gate, like this one, all right? When you do that, Now, the double bond is going to be between these two carbons, and now you have a positive charge over here. And there's my resonance arrows. Okay, and if we wanted to draw the hybrid, again, draw what's consistent. Right, draw what's always there. All right, so that's what's always there, and then sometimes we have double bonds between these two carbons, do 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 do, and sometimes we have them between these two, do 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 do. All right, sometimes this carbon is positive, sometimes it's not, so that'll get a partial positive. Same here. All right. Very good. Let's try one more. Ooh, let me find a good example. Oh, this one's cool. All right. This is the carbonate ion. You learned about this in high school in general chemistry. Carbonate, as you guys know, is CO3 minus 2. All right, and if you want to look at the Lewis structure, here is a Lewis structure. And so formal charge of negative there, formal charge of negative there. So overall, we have a negative 2 charge. All right? All right, so you see here, there's, there's lots of places where we could look at here. I always like to start from areas of charge if possible. So we see we have a negative charge here. All right, so I'm going to take this pair of electrons, move it over there. And you sort of get a domino effect, right? Just like we saw before, this carbon would have too many electrons, but it can kick a pair of pi electrons up to this oxygen. Not a double bond anymore. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. My daughter's talking over the video. Hopefully you didn't hear. I'm giving her a really nasty look right now. Hey, I'm playing Roblox. Shh. In case you're interested, she's playing Roblox right now. She's probably losing. No, it's not losing. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's get back to chemistry. All right. So you see here, uh, we have, yes, a perfectly valid Lewis structure. You can see that a pair of electrons is shared amongst sort of this whole area. Okay. Now, an interesting thing about this one is actually it's going to have more than one. So, yeah, you can have more than one uh, resonance structure. Let's say, you know, you see over here we kind of started on this side. 
actually we could have started from this side as well, right? We could have easily made a Lewis structure that looked like this. And we can, and it is, it's perfectly valid. So in this case, we actually have three different Lewis structures. So that means carbonate, even though it's got a it's got a charge, it's a, got a negative two charge, is highly, highly stabilized because of such a high level of delocalization. And if you want to look at the hybrid, it's kind of funny looking. Again, draw everything that's constant. Right? And then you have dotted lines. Oh, that looks terrible. So sorry. Those didn't come out dotted at all. It's really hard doing dotted lines on a tablet application with this big fat stylus. But there you go. You can sort of see it. And we'd have partial negatives here, here, and here. All right. Definitely encourage you to get a lot of practice in. Um, like I said, sometimes people have a little bit of a harder time with resonant structures than you know, other things, but once you get the hang of them, they're very much second nature to you. Um, just some things to remember. I'm getting a lag here with my stylus. All right, I already, I already mentioned one of them. I mentioned charge in equals charge out. So got to have equivalent charges on both of your resonance structures. Okay. Um, when you're doing these, only carbon can have an incomplete octet. Don't try to give um, oxygen, nitrogen, or halogen an incomplete octet. They do not like that since they're really, really electronegative. Also, no expanded octets. None of the atoms that we're working with, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen or halogens, none of them are capable of going more than eight electrons in their outer shell, so make sure they follow the octet rules. Okay, and also, there's one more, and this relates to a concept I haven't mentioned yet, but I'm going to go ahead and write it. Out of the two or three or however many resonance structures that you have, they're not all of equal stability all the time. Sometimes one of them might be more stable than the others. This is referred to as being a major contributor. You know, resonant structures can either be major contributors, equivalent contributors, or minor contributors. All right? Things that contribute to a major contributor are going to be more bonds and fewer areas of charge. More bonds, fewer areas of charge. All right, let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so let's say we had this. Okay. All right, if you look at that, everything is neutral in there. Everything follows the octet rules. Everything is happy, right? It's a very, very stable situation. Technically, it is possible to draw a resonance structure here. It is possible to kick up a pair of pi electrons. Come on, come on. There we go. Up to that oxygen.
right? And we said carbon is capable of having an incomplete octet, all right? We learned that that gives it a positive charge. Oxygen has still a regular octet, but it's got more electron density than usual, so it's got a negative charge. Charge in does equal charge out here because the positive and negative cancel each other out to make it neutral. However, not or these two are not equivalent contributors to each other. The top one has definitely more bonds and fewer areas of charge than the bottom one does, so we would say this one would be major and this one would be minor. So that's an important concept to keep in mind whenever you're trying to figure out, you know, major and minor contributors. That means that the hybrid of this would lo actually look much more like this structure than it would like the bottom one. All right. One last thing I want to mention, and we're done with resonance for the moment. I just want to mention everything we've been talking about so far has followed the octet rule, right? The atoms that we're working with, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, the halogens, and then we saw hydrogen is kind of its own thing. We will occasionally run into some other atoms that can do other things. All right, so these are some exceptions to the octet rule. Ooh, I wrote that really messy. Sorry about that. All right. First of all, you do occasionally run into an atom that will pop up that will have an incomplete octet, just simply because it doesn't have um, the electrons present to fill them, to fill the octet. Um, we run into this with elements like beryllium, right? Beryllium has very, very few electrons. Um, in fact, it's only got two valence electrons. Right? So, for example, if you bonded beryllium with two hydrogens, it would have enough electrons to make two bonds. Right? We get two valence electrons from beryllium, one each from hydrogen. That means we can make two bonds. We just simply don't have any electrons. But beryllium is perfectly stable in this state, and in fact, it is neutral. Uh, we see something similar with boron, which is a B. Boron has th uh, three valence electrons, sorry. Um, and that means it can make only a maximum of three bonds. Uh, but again, it's perfectly happy that way. It's perfectly neutral. Um, we don't see these very much in organic chemistry, but there are selected instances where we will run into them, so it's kind of important to be aware of. And then we do have cases where we can have expanded octets. Sulfur and phosphorus particularly are important to us as organic chemists. What does it mean to expand our octet? That just simply means you can, you can hold more than eight in the outer shell. This is because sulfur and phosphorus have additional um, energy levels and orbitals that are not present in some of the other ones. Okay? So just as an example, let's see. Sulfur is kind of, sulfur is interesting. It's kind of versatile. It can hold 10 electrons in its outer shell and be neutral. I'm tired, so you see I'm getting sloppy. Hopefully you can still read it. Sorry about that. Yeah, in this case, sulfur has a double bond to oxygen, a single bond to two carbons, and an unshared pair. So it actually has 10. Perfectly neutral. This is a compound called dimethyl sulfoxide, which we uh, actually use commonly in organic chemistry as a solvent. Uh, here's an example where sulfur actually has 12. I'm going to erase this so it doesn't bleed over. Yeah, sulfur is perfectly neutral. 
double bonded to two ox different oxygens, single bonded to two other ones. It's actually got 12 electrons in this outer shell. Perfectly stable. By the way, this is a molecule you've probably heard of. This is sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid eats people. And it has a Lewis structure that looks like that. Phosphorus is also another one that we'll use. We'll use phosphorus a bit, especially in organic too, when we get to something called the Wittig reaction. Um, but for now, I just want you to be aware that it also can expand its octet. This little guy right here. This is another acid that you may have heard of. This is phosphoric acid. And you can see phosphorus here has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 electrons in its outer shell. Uh, another place where you might commonly find phosphorus is in biological applications. Um, stuff like ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It's actually an organic molecule. Um, and you can see an example of phosphorus expanding an octet in that structure. All right, that's enough for right now. Um, we are done drawing these Lewis structures for the moment. Um, what I'm going to do next is, thank goodness, try to learn how to draw these more efficiently. Believe it or not, we don't have to actually draw every single bond and every single atom and every single electron pair all the time. There are shortcuts. So thankfully, we're getting to that, and so we can be a little bit more efficient with our drawings. All right, until then, happy studying. Let me know if you have any questions.